Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Week 5 college football DFS main slate on DraftKings and FanDuel, the noon Eastern time slate, the one that already has the salaries out for it on DraftKings and hopefully is upcoming soon here on FanDuel. We're going to break down the slate from a perspective of the games that you want to target and get pieces into your lineups. We're going to talk about the best plays at quarterback, running back, and wide receiver all along talking expected ownership and lineup construction. That is going to help you win money in DFS for this Saturday slate. If you watched last week, hopefully you won yourself some money because there were a lot of calls that I actually got right last week, just to be quite honest with you. Thomas Castellanos, I said he was going to be a GPP winner, and he absolutely was. I talked about all the kinds of game stacks that you could use, and all of the GPP winners were essentially a game stack of the Boston College and Louisville game, which kind of made me sad that Boston College wasn't on this slate because their defense is just really, really bad. And I think for the rest of the season, playing quarterbacks and wide receivers against Boston College is just going to be a viable strategy. But that game stack allowed a lot of people to win a lot of money. And so hopefully I'm going to have some calls, have some takes here in this episode that is going to help people here again in week five. Now, this might be a little bit of a shorter episode. I'm not going to lie to y'all. This is my first week after having the baby where I am back at work and I'm a little tired, I'm a little exhausted. So I've done all the research. I put all the work into it. Hopefully going to get it out to you guys in a quick, efficient way that is going to help you for this Saturday. All right. So let's go ahead and dive in with talking about the games that we want to target for the main all right, so let's go ahead and break down the games themselves. So first off, this is a very important segment of the show because pretty much if you can find yourself a game to target that ends up shooting out big, you can end up winning yourself a lot of money like last week with the Louisville Boston College game. And most of my best lineups this year have been game stacks where I pretty much just loaded up on a game and hoped that it went pretty big. I was able to, you know, min cash last week with um, some Clemson Florida State game stacks as well as some Colorado Oregon game stacks, even though getting over, you know, the points from Shadur Sanders was a little tough to overcome, but it was possible. Now, let's go ahead and talk about some games that you might be able to target this week. So the first one that projects to be a shootout, and again, when I say shootout, I want the point total to be over 50, and I want the point spread to be under seven points. I want it to be a one possession game, total of higher than 50. The first one is Clemson at Syracuse. So Clemson is six and a half point favorites with a total of 52.5 in the game, which has actually risen to 53.5 since I did my research. So this is implied about Clemson 30 to 23 ish. Last year, when this game was at Death Valley, Clemson won 27 21. Both these teams can put points on the board. Neither of these defenses is dominant. That could be a game that could be a sneaky shootout. Next up is going to be Texas A&M versus Arkansas. This one it has the Aggies a six and a half point favorites with a total of 54.5. So it is implied to be about Texas A&M 31 to 24, which is a pretty good game environment if both teams are going to score 24 points. Last year, these two teams played in, it was 23 to 21. Connor Weigman was not yet the quarterback at Texas A&M though in that game. Um, so definitely a little bit lacking on the offensive side from the Aggies from what we can grow to expect this year. Illinois at Purdue, I think is a really sneaky one. Like I think this has the potential to be the Boston College Louisville of this slate. Illinois at Purdue currently has Purdue as one and a half point favorites, and it has the total at 53.5, and it is implied at Purdue 28 to 26 at the moment, and I cannot find it on FanDuel Sportsbook if you were looking at YouTube. I'm going to keep searching though. Now the next game that could shoot out big is going to be Boise State at Memphis. This one could be a really lucrative one. It's got Boise um, looking at three and a half point favorites right now with a total at 59.5. So it is projected to be about Boise 31 to 28. Anytime you got both teams approaching on 30 points, that could be a lucrative one. Now we've also got two games that are um, projected to be a little bit lopsided, but have teams that you might end up, you know, being able to target individually. First one is Kansas at Texas. Um, Texas is just having a heck of a season so far. And as a longtime Longhorn fan, they have me really excited, even though I know they're just going to break my heart in the most depressing way possible because that's what they've done for the last 15 years. But right now I've got a lot of optimism, got a lot of excitement. This Texas team is really good. Right now they're 16 and a half point favorites over this Kansas squad, and the game is implied to be about 39 to 23. So this Texas team is one of the highest totals of the slate. You're definitely going to want to get some exposure to some Longhorns in your lineup this week. Last one is going to be U.S see at Colorado with the rare 9 a.m. local time game, or excuse me, 10 a.m. local time game. I believe Colorado is mountain time. Um, and that's a really difficult ask for a college kid. You know, when I was at UNC Charlotte, I worked in the film department and, you know, road games, especially when you have these early kickoffs, the, the 
game day operation it is not just something where you just walk into the arena and, and you play. You know, you've got to have pregame meal. You've got to travel from the hotel. You've got to, you know, do this in the locker room. And it, it's just a lot. And to be able to play a game at 10 a.m. local time is going to be a tough ask. But this game has the highest total of the slate. USC is 21 and a half point favorites with the t- um, total of 73.5. So this game is implied to be about USC 48 to 26. That 48 for USC is the absolute highest on the slate. So let's go ahead and talk about this game because it's a natural segue into talking about the quarterback position because the two highest priced quarterbacks on the slate on DraftKings are in this game, USC at Colorado. So Colorado, what we learned last week when they played Oregon is that team as fun as they are and as big of a national story as they are and as cool as they are, they're not quite ready to compete with some of the best teams in the country at the line of scrimmage on the offensive and defensive lines. Oregon was able to do whatever they wanted in the ground game. They were able to have all day to throw. And uh, on the other side of it, they were, you know, they had Shadur Sanders under duress all day. You know, Colorado just couldn't get anything going. I think Oregon was a little bit of a bad matchup for Colorado. I think this USC team that's a little um, more finesse, should I say, um, is a better matchup for Colorado. And so I think Colorado will be able to put up some points in this game. So this would be a real interesting one to stack, even though if you want to totally stack this game, you're going to have to pay up a lot for Caleb Williams and Shadur Sanders. So are either of them worth paying up for? Well, Caleb Williams is $10,500 on DraftKings, and I think he can be worth every penny. He's got an insane floor. His lowest scoring game this season was 27 points in a romp over San Jose State, and Colorado has given up 27 seven fantasy points to three of four quarterbacks so far this season, the only one not being Jeff Sims of Nebraska. Now, there's plenty of value on this slate at the running back and wide receiver positions and really the other quarterbacks that I think you can squeeze Con- or Caleb Williams into your lineup. However, squeezing him in with Shadour Sanders with another quarterback that's $9,500 is going to be pretty tough. So the question is, is Shadour Sanders worth it? Well, the Oregon game was his first game under 29 fantasy points all season. One thing that is kind of a red flag to me, though, is how much he's getting sacked. If you are not aware, sacks count for negative rushing yards in college football statistics. So he has lost three fantasy points rushing in three or four games this season. He's gotten to negative 30 yards. His offensive line play is really bad, and if they don't start protecting him, it could get really bad for Shadour. But you know he's going to have a lot of volume. He's attempted over 33 or more passes in every game. And, you know, this Colorado team operates at a fast tempo. This USC team operates at a fast tempo. So if Colorado is able to have success offensively, Shadour Sanders is going to be able to have a lot of success. And you can see both of these quarterbacks in line for a big day uh, in Boulder on Saturday. Now, the next quarterback that I want to talk about is Connor Weigman of Texas A&M. I think he's got a lot of upside if he plays. Texas A&M is implied 31 points in this game. And in every game that he's finished, he scored over 28 fantasy points, which is not that common for a guy who's really a pocket passer and doesn't give you a whole lot of upside. The Arkansas defense has also struggled against competition this year. Arkansas has given up 34 or more points to each Power 5 team they have played. If Connor Weigman is active um, for this game against Arkansas, I think he's a real easy click. Max Johnson becomes kind of a sneaky play if Weigman is out. I don't think Max Johnson has the same upside. I don't think Texas A&M will have the same success with Max Johnson, but I do think that he could be a pretty good per dollar play if Weigman is also out. Now, Quinn Ewers is a guy that we got to talk about as a Longhorns fan, right? So Quinn Ewers... In this game, Texas has implied almost 40 points, right? And he's been really good so far this season. Like, his play in real life has been really good, and his play on the fantasy field has been pretty good. He's averaging almost 26 fantasy points a game. The only risk with this is if Texas gets there, if they get to their 40 points by running the football and by, you know, all these rushing touchdowns, and it's not Quinn Ewers throwing the ball into the end zone. It's the running backs running the ball into the end zone. That would be my only concern with Quinn Ewers. But other than that, I think he's a pretty solid play. If you think Kansas keeps this game competitive, then a Quinn Ewers and Jaywin Daniels game stack would absolutely be on the table, in my opinion. 
Now, Talia Tagovailoa is the last quarterback in the 8K range that I'm actually interested in. There's a lot of quarterbacks in the 8K range this week on DraftKings that just don't have a super high ceiling. I think Tagovailoa is one that does. He's had two games this ceiling that round to 30 points. I know I'm, I'm stretching it a little bit there, but he's been pretty good this year. And I, I think you're really, if you play somebody in the 8K range, you want somebody who has easy 30-point upside. The only concern is that Indiana's defense has been pretty good. They only gave up 23 points to Ohio State in week one, and that's the most they've given up all season. They only average 178 passing yards allowed. I do think Maryland wins this game. I do think Tagovailo has some success, but the matchup does give me a little bit of a pause on that one. Now, if you're looking for some value plays, at quarterback, starting in an even 8K, you have Seth Hennigan of Memphis, who has scored in between 24 and 28 fantasy points in every game he's played this season. He also has three rushing touchdowns so far this year, so he you know does give you a little bit of rushing upside as well. And we've seen Boise get torn up multiple times this year, specifically by Michael Penix Jr. in Washington in Week 1. If this game shoots out, Seth Hennigan could be a big-time play. Now, speaking of game stacks, there's two quarterbacks here in the 7K range that are going up against each other, uh, Cade Klubnick and Gary. Garrett Schrader in the Clemson-Maryland game. Now, Cade Klubnik quietly has 21 fantasy points in three straight games, and we mentioned this before, but I think he kind of got really unlucky in the red zone against Duke. That easily could have been a 25 fantasy point performance and like a 28-28 type of game, but he just wasn't. Now, Garrett Schrader has also been really up and down this season. He's shown 50-point upside with a 52 fantasy point performance against uh, Purdue in week three. Um, other than that, all of his performances have been in between 23 and 29 fantasy points. That's still pretty good value from a quarterback at $7,400. You really want a bare minimum of three times uh, their salary. So like for a $7,000 quarterback, you really want a minimum of 2100 if you want any chance at cashing in a college football DFS contest. Last year against Clemson, Garrett Schrader ran for 71 yards and a touchdown. So I do think that that upside that he gives you with his legs is still going to be present here against the Tigers. KJ Jefferson, is another one in the 7K range that I want to mention. Uh, he had a big day against Texas A&M last year. Last year in that game, he had 34 fantasy points against Texas A&M with 100 yards rushing. Um, he has not seen like a super high rushing total yet this year, and he is a quarterback that runs the football a lot. He's averaging um, – a little over 12 attempts, um, you know, on the ground. And so I definitely think that this could be a really good spot for KJ Jefferson to get back to what he did last year. Now, speaking of values, got to talk about Hudson Card. So if you're looking for this week's version of the Jack Plummer, Thomas Castellanos, Louisville, Boston College game, it might just be this Illinois Purdue game. And you got Hudson Card there at $6,600. And he's getting a lot of volume. He's attempted over 30 passes in every game. This Purdue offense, now that it's the air raid, is going to throw the ball all over the yard. So you're going to get plenty of opportunities to put up fancy points. And Illinois' defense has given up 30 points to every Power 5 team they have played. So if that trend continues and Purdue gets to 30 points, it runs an air raid offense, it's very likely the Hudson card gets to value very quickly. Now, on the other side of this same game, you have Luke Altmeyer for Illinois, the old Miss transfer, and I think he's actually got some sneaky upside. He had 30, 31 fancy point performance against Kansas earlier this year. There's not a whole lot of guys you're going to find that are you know in the $5,000 range at quarterback that have legitimate 30 fancy point upside. I think Luke Altmeyer is going to be pretty popular this week because you're going to see people play Caleb Williams at the top and then Luke Altmeyer to, you know, to save a little bit of salary so that way they can get better plays at running back and wide receiver. But I really do like the play. I don't think this Purdue defense is all that great. They let Garrett Schrader run for uh, almost 200 yards on him if you saw the Garrett Schrader box score. So I definitely think it's a really good spot for Luke Altmeyer. Now, the last quarterback that I'm going to mention, the last one that's probably going to make my list this week, is going to be Taywin Green of Boise State. To me, he showed a lot of upside with his legs in 2022. Hasn't really gotten there in 2023. Hasn't rushed for more than 40 yards in a single game. But I do know that the up side is there. This game should be pretty high scoring, and if it does get high scoring, Taylor Green will be a reason why. In terms of injuries to monitor, um, there is the Nebraska situation where you've got Jeff Sims questionable and um, Heinrich Harburg 
hopefully I said that correctly, um, is looking like he's going to be the starter if Jeff Sims is out. But I'll be honest, going up against Michigan, like they would have to be negative salary for me to want to play him. Like DraftKings would have to be giving me salary back to want to play a Nebraska player this week. Um, so I am out on those. But if you're looking to monitor injuries, that is one that you probably should be monitoring. All right, so that does it for the quarterback position. Let's go ahead and take a quick breather, and then let's talk some running back. Now, if you heard me talk about all those quarterbacks and are wondering, wait a minute, who's actually making my lineups this week? Well, there's a whole lot of other places where you can get more information from me. First off, you can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. Um, I tweet out the rundown for every college football DFS slate where I talk about some of my favorite types of plays. Um, and then also, I'm in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description. We got a lot of people in there who play a lot of different sports in DFS and are very knowledgeable. There's a lot of good discussion in there, a lot of good people who are just really good at talking DFS and college football is one of the sports that we focus on. Uh, and then also I do write a full article every slate on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks, where I talk about my core plays. I talk about ownership. I talk about lineup construction, strategies, you know, information to know, and just all the information that I gathered during the week pretty much goes in that full article on the Patreon that I post on Friday. Now, also, if you're looking to try something new this football season. Maybe you want to try player props on underdog or prize picks. You know, maybe you want to just, you know, straight up bet games at a sports book. Well, you head on over to my page, signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks. You'll get the best promo codes and offers for any new user on any uh, sports book, DFS site, or player prop site that is available in your area. It will even sync to your location and show you just what is available. And it also helps me out if you use my page to get there. Signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks if you're looking to try something new. All right, so let's go ahead and break down the backs now. So the top running back on the slate comes as no surprise. It's the best running back in college football, in my opinion. It's Blake Corner of Michigan. Now, in my opinion, I think he should cost a little less, but also at the same time, in my opinion, I think there's more separation between him and the rest of the field than looking at where he's at on the board. Like to me, if Blake Corum's 8,300, there shouldn't be another running back that's above like 7,200. I think he is vastly above the rest of the field. Now, Nebraska's a pretty solid matchup. They, they haven't really shown a whole lot defensively yet this year. And the problem is with Corum, though, is that this game could probably really easily turn into a blowout. And so if you want him to hit value, if you want him to be a GPP winner for you, he's going to have to probably get to 100 yards to give you that bonus three points on DraftKings. And he's probably going to have to get at least two touchdowns if you want him to hit value. And, and in a game that might turn into a blowout, that's definitely a risky proposition. I would not really I, – I just don't think he's got a super whole lot of upside for his price tag. But I don't mind the play this week against Nebraska and with the lack of other dominant running backs on the board. So speaking of those other running backs on the board, Jaden out of Cal is second on the list, and I was a little surprised. I think he's a little bit overpriced, but I think it's a really good matchup, like just a really, really good matchup. The USC running backs last week averaged over eight yards per carry against the Arizona State run defense. So if they can do that, then Jaden Ott can do that as well. He's a bit of a workhorse, averaging over 18 carries a game. So I really think that Jaden Ott is a pretty solid play. I just wish he was a little bit cheaper. Now, speaking of those USC running backs, Marshawn Lloyd, I still feel is overpriced, but he is the guy in the USC backfield that I want. He is the, you know, the guy now as opposed to um, Austin Jones. On week four's game against Arizona State, Marshawn Lloyd outcarried uh, Jones 14 to 3. And I think Colorado is a pretty good matchup as well. We, you know, we've seen teams be, you know, more physical than this Colorado team. And, and I, as much as I think USC is a little bit finesse, I think USC's offensive line will have a little bit of an advantage. And I think Marshawn Lloyd will be a great leverage play on Caleb Williams. Like if you're not planning on playing Caleb Williams in your lineup, then playing Marshawn Lloyd would give you an out to where if Caleb Williams doesn't have a good game, it's very likely that Marshawn Lloyd is the recipient of all those touchdowns, not Caleb Williams. So I, I definitely think that he would be a solid leverage play if you're looking to be you know, an ownership leverage type of guy in DFS. Now, the Penn State running backs to me, um, Katron Allen and, and Noah Singleton, to me, they are almost unplayable because they're in pretty much a 50-50 split. They're, they're very high priced on DraftKings. I'm kind of out on both of them at, at cost, but I do want to acknowledge that Northwestern's a pretty good matchup. And, and if you're playing multiple lineups or you know, you know maybe you want to take a stand on one guy and hope that he's really low owned, that there's an opportunity there, but I'm out at cost right now. But a guy I'm in on is going to be Roman Hemby of Maryland, who has a great matchup going up against Indiana. Um, and, you know, he's shown 
some big time games. He, he had almost 35 against Charlotte, had almost 20 against Virginia on only nine carries. Um, I definitely think Roman Hemby is in play this week as the last really expensive running back that I'm willing to go to. Now, one guy that I think is real easy um, to click this week is Ashton Janti. I think it is Janti, not Jinti. I, I just like saying Janti a little bit better, so that's how I'm going to say it. So Aston Janti should be a lineup lock, in my opinion, as long as George Halani is out. Pretty much last year, Halani and Janti were in like a 60-40 committee in favor of Halani. And right now, Halani has been injured, and they've just given the whole 60 to Janti, and he's been really good so far this year. He hasn't had under 28 fantasy points in a game. He's averaging more fantasy points per game than Blake Corum right now. And he's just been an elite fantasy option as long as Halani's out. And if Halani continues to be out, then Jonti is a very easy click at $6,800 on DraftKings. Now, on the other side of this game is going to be Blake Watson of the Memphis Tigers. He scored 28 or more fantasy points in three of his four games so far, which is quite impressive. And he actually is a pretty like solid workhorse. He averages 14 carries and six catches per game. That use in the passing game makes him very viable as a stacking partner. If you're looking to make this a game stack and play the Memphis quarterback and the running back together, I think that's a very reasonable possibility with as much usage as Watson gets in the passing game. Cam Scadabo of Arizona State is another interesting play. Honestly, this 6K range at running back to me is absolutely loaded this week, y'all. I think there's a lot of guys in this range that I'm going to be willing to play, and I'm probably going to build out some game stacks that are going to allow me to you know, get some exposures to a lot of these different running backs in the 6K range. So Cam Scadabo had 24 touches against USC. Um, Arizona State really kind of – they wanted to kind of hide Drew Pine in that game. Uh, you know, former Notre Dame quarterback Drew Pine, um, not exactly like a prolific passer of the ball, kind of a game manager type of guy. Uh, and so with Pine starting, they gave Scadabo more touches. If Rashada comes back or Bourget comes back, I don't know if Scadabo is going to be, you know, that big of a touch guy. But I do definitely think that um, if Pine's the starter, Scadabo is going to get a huge workload yet again. Now, Devin Mockaby is a guy that has upside but also concern. Upside because this Illinois run defense is really brutal, but concern because he's seeing his workload trend in the wrong direction. Um, you know, he started off the season with, you know, games of 16 and 21 carries, and then he has 16 carries combined in his last two games. It's not exactly what we want to see. Tyrone Tracy is eating into his workload and getting more carries. Tyrone Tracy has actually been in double digit fantasy points every game so far, but this Illinois defense can be ran on, and I definitely want to make sure that I play at least one lineup with Mike or Tyrone Tracy in it this weekend. Now, the Texas backfield is much more clear. Jonathan Brooks is the lead dog right now, and as talented as C.J. Baxter is, C.J. Baxter will get there, but right now it's Jonathan Brooks' backfield. At least that's what the usage is telling me. Now, last year, Texas ran all over Kansas. They ran for over 400 yards against them. Bijan Robinson ran for about 240, and Jonathan Brooks, as the third string running back behind Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson, ran for over 100. So if you're looking at a game where the third string running back is running for 100, Texas just has a clear advantage at the line of scrimmage on Kansas. At least they did last year, and I expect that it continued this year with Texas returning pretty much their entire offensive line. And, and so you're looking at a situation where, with Jonathan Brooks where he's got an insane insanely high ceiling this week with that matchup against Kansas. And I kind of like it even more if you think that Kansas keeps the game close because I think Texas is going to look to run the football. Personally, I would probably prefer to play Brooks in the run game ahead of Quinn Ewers in the passing game this week against Kansas. Now, Will Shipley of, of Clemson, to me, stands out as a misprice, if I'm being honest. I thought he was a misprice last week. I think he's a misprice again this week at only $200 more. He's averaging 27.9 fantasy points per game against ACC opponents. Last year, he absolutely dominated Syracuse. He had 172 yards and two touchdowns against the Orange last year. LaQuint Allen of Syracuse, on the other side, is also in play, in my opinion. I don't think necessarily that he's going to be as successful as Will Shipley. I think the Clemson matchup's a little bit tougher, but he's been a super consistent option so far this season, at least 19 fantasy points in every game. And he's a little bit cheaper than some of those 6K running backs that are you know, looking at pretty similar production so far this year. Trevor Etienne of Florida is a guy that I do want to mention. Like, I just think he's underutilized. Like, you know, watching him in that Tennessee game two weeks ago, 
this guy's super talented. Like, it's not shocking for a guy whose last name's Etienne and his brother plays in the NFL, but I just think he's really talented. And in that game against Tennessee, he had 26 fantasy points. It's because he got 23 carries. And he really hasn't gotten anywhere close to that this season. In fact, his second highest number of carries in a game is 11. If Florida would really commit to Trevor Etienne and make him the lead back, he could be in for a huge day. And I hope they will do that because he has the talent to do that. But it just hasn't happened other than that Tennessee game. So if you're looking for a guy that is probably going to be pretty low owned a decent dart throw this week trevor Etienne might be that guy now last two that i do want to mention arkansas has had some injuries at the running back position and so rashad dubinion was the lead dog last week he had 15 carries against lsu after having 13 carries against byu um, i don't think the matchup against texas a&m is as good as the one against lsu but he is the lead dog in an offense that is pretty darn run heavy and then Jalen Lucas of Indiana, um, there's some injuries to this backfield in Indiana, and it's been kind of a committee so far. Lucas has been the big play guy. Um, at least he was against Indiana State, um, and he was against uh, Louisville with what he did through the air. So if you're looking at a guy that has a chance to go big from a low salary, Lucas might be that guy, um, especially if he is going to be the lead dog with all the injuries that Indiana has in the backfield. It's definitely a situation to monitor as the week goes on. All right, that does it for the running back position. So let's go ahead and switch over and talk about some wide receiver. All right, so to be totally honest, this is really a different landscape at the wide receiver position than what we're used to seeing. Like we got Ricky Pearsall of Florida at the top of the board at the wide receiver position. And this is to take nothing away from Pearsall. He's a really solid player, but like it's a far cry from the weeks where we've got like Marvin Harrison Jr. and Romo Dunes and you know, guys like that that are at the top of the board. So definitely a little different this week. Not to say that I wouldn't play Pearsall because like he's been a super consistent option. He's he's gotten a lot of targets for these Florida Gators, but it's just weird that he's the guy at the top of the board. Now, in my opinion, the guy that would be my top play would be Evan Stewart of the Texas A&M Aggies. So Evan Stewart, like really start off the season strong with 34 and 28 fantasy points in his first two games. I think the game against Auburn last week, though, was a little bit more of an aberration than the norm. He only had 14 fantasy points. I used the word only very loosely there. Um, you know, Connor Weidman got hurt in the middle of the game. Evan Stewart was questionable beforehand, so he, you know, really we didn't know if he was going to go or not. So if you're looking at a full-strength Evan Stewart with Connor Weidman throwing him the football, this is a really solid option at wide receiver. And if you're looking at the wide receiver position this week, personally for me, what I'm looking at doing is I'm playing the quarterbacks that I want to play. I'm going to build out a game stack. I'm going to play the running backs that are in the 6K range, and I'm probably going to find some one-off wide receivers um, that I like, you know, depending on what the budget is, depending on how much I spent up at quarterback and on the game stack. So if you're able to get to the top of the board, Elijah Stewart would be the guy to go to. Now, Texas A&M, if, you know, they've been pretty solid through the air, if Connor Wagman's playing, he can support multiple successful fancy wide receivers. You know, Noah Thomas has been, you know, only slightly less successful than Evan Stewart this season. Now, on the other side of the ball in this game, you've got two really solid options for Arkansas if you're looking to really stack the Texas A&M Arkansas game. You've got Anthony Armstrong, who has had at least 13 fantasy points in every game and at least 18 in three of four. It's pretty solid. And then you've also got Luke Haas, I believe I'm saying correctly, um, who has had really nice weeks each of the last two weeks, 17 and 34 fantasy points in those two performances. Um, and, you know, coming off of those two, I, I really like the upside that we're getting from Luke Haas. Now, the USC Colorado game is an interesting one because Caleb Williams spreads the ball around so much that I don't even think you need to stack Caleb Williams with a wide receiver because, like, it, it's just so hard to predict which one. Like, all of these guys are going to come in, like, moderately owned, you know, maybe one of them might have a good game. I definitely don't think it's likely that two of them have a good game. You know, so when you're looking at all these guys on USC, it, trying to pick which one is just kind of a nightmare. Like if you're playing multiple lineups, it's definitely something you can take multiple shots at down the board. But if you're playing single entry, I really think you can play Caleb Williams unstacked. So Brendan Rice is the guy that's coming off the big game um, against Arizona State. He had seven catches, 133 yards, and two touchdowns, 35.3 fantasy points on DraftKings. The guy who's been the most consistent is Zachariah Branch. You know, he's had double-digit fantasy points in all three games he's played in, which is, you know, can't be said for all the guys in this USC receiving core, but it can be said for Branch. Um, but he's not like a full-time player in the offense. So I don't think he has like super high upside for that reason, just because he's not going to be on the field all that much. For Colorado, it's a pretty clear pecking order. If Xavier Weaver plays, it's going to be Weaver, 
Horn Jr., and then Javon Antonio, who are going to be on the field with Travis Hunter out um, with his injury from the Colorado State game. Um, and then if Xavier Weaver is out, then it's going to open the door to Tavares Dawson as well. So at least you've got a pretty clear peck in order from the Colorado side of things who to go with. You know, the Oregon game was not a bright spot for any of those guys. In fact, the guy that had the most success was tight end Michael Harrison. Um, and with Travis Hunter continuing to be out and, you know, Colorado having to dip into the receiving core, it could be, you know, a little bit more productive a little bit more snaps out of that tight end Michael Harrison so for the Colorado guys if you're looking to stack it up definitely learn the status of Weaver but if Weaver does not go you got Horn Jr. Antonio Dawson and then the tight end Harrison that are going to be playing all of the snaps now Boise so far has demonstrated a one-man passing attack and that is Eric McAllister um, he has led the team in targets pretty significantly. Um, he's averaging about five catches a game. He, he's just been really solid for the Boise State Broncos. If you're playing anybody in the Boise passing game, he's the only guy that I would consider. Memphis has three guys that are playing more than anybody else. It's Rock Taylor, Demir Blankamsey, and um, Joseph Skates. The, the target shares have been pretty inconsistent. Um, Rock Taylor's really come on strong as of late. Demir Blankamsey is kind of like the, the short, the intermediate slot guy that you know doesn't really get a whole lot of deep targets or anything like that whereas joseph skates is the guy that you know can be targeted deep a little bit more so that memphis receiving core is a little harder to predict like i said earlier if i'm stacking the memphis side of things i'm probably playing their running back with their quarterback as opposed to wide receivers now for texas there's two guys that I'm interested in. Xavier Worthy is the team leader in targets. He's the guy that gets you know most of the deep shots, and he's just been a really solid player for three years. You know at Texas, he's got at least 12 fantasy points in every game, so he's got a pretty solid floor. The tight end, Jatavian Sanders, is another guy I'm interested in. Had a really big game against Baylor with five catches for 110 yards, 19 fantasy points. He's been underpriced the entire season, but I still think he's underpriced even at $4,700 $4, on DraftKings. And then on the Kansas side of things, there's only one receiver I'm interested in. Their target, their leader so far has been Lawrence Arnold. Like, if you think things change and maybe it goes to Grimm, like, I mean, go for it. But I just... I think you can kind of avoid the Kansas side of things. Even if you're playing Jaywin Daniels, I think you can play him unstacked with a wide receiver because he does a lot with his legs. Now, the Illinois-Purdue game, we've been mentioning this one kind of all episode. Um, there's a few guys I'm looking at here for the Illinois side of things. It's Isaiah Williams. He is the target leader, even though he's not the highest-priced guy. Um, he's also not a guy that sees like a whole lot of deep shots. He tends to catch a lot of passes underneath and then make guys miss, but he gets a lot of targets. And I think he's been a little unlucky with touchdowns. He has 24 catches, 333 yards so far this season, and no touchdowns. So I definitely think Isaiah Williams is due. He's the guy that I want on the Illini side of things. And then on the Purdue side of things, Deion Burks has been the guy and, and DraftKings continues to not price him up. But the bad news is like he's going to be pretty highly owned. Like he's been, you know, pretty much all season long. So if you're looking for a pivot play, their second leading target getter, who's been really solid in each of the last two weeks is Abdur Rahman Yassin. Um, you know, double digit fantasy points each of the last two weeks for Yassin. Now a few one-offs that I would consider if you're not looking at a game stack or a game that's really worth stacking. Uh, first one is Brock Bowers of Georgia, best tight end in the nation, only $5,400 on DraftKings, at least seven catches in each of the last two games. Fire up Brock Bowers with confidence. He is Georgia's guy in the passing game. And if Vlad McConkie continues to miss, Brock Bowers is going to be like the main dependable target in this Georgia passing attack. The Clemson-Syracuse game also features a few more that I would be interested in. For Syracuse, their best receiver, Aranda Gazden, is out for the season. Well, receiver slash tight end. He kind of does a little bit of both. But with him out for the season, Damian Alford has kind of stepped up um, and been that guy recently. Um, you know, he had 25 fantasy points against Army, nine catches in that game. If he continues to be a target monster, he's going to continue to be a producer in fantasy. And then for Clemson, you've got Antonio Williams likely missing this game, um, like he did miss the Florida State game. Bo Collins kind of ascended to being like the alpha in the passing attack. And then Tyler Brown was the direct beneficiary of the Antonio Williams role. Tyler Brown was really solid against FSU, five catches for 84 yards. If he found the end zone, it would have looked a lot better as a really, really solid performance out of Brown. All right, that does it for the wide receiver position. Again, when it comes to those wide receivers this week, y'all, like just – just stack up your quarterbacks that, you know, stack up the game if you're doing that um, and, you know, go from there. Like I just, there's not really a whole lot of like outstanding wide receiver plays on this slate, but you know, if you're looking, if you find the right guys, you find the right combination of stacking partners and one-offs, you can definitely um, have a solid 
outing with, you know, this Saturday, this, this slate. So that does it for this episode of the college football DFS preview for week five. If you want more from me, remember you can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. You can join the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description on YouTube. Also, if you like what you saw on YouTube, please hit that like button and hit that subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. It helps the videos get noticed. I really do appreciate it. And if you subscribe, you'll be notified when all of our weekly golf, college football, and NFL content drops during the fall. And if you want to read my full article on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. I talk about my core play ownership strategies the whole lot all in one big long article that i write once a week for every golf college football and nfl slate all right that does it for this episode y'all hopefully was able to get you guys some information on this one that is going to help you win in dfs this week um so best of luck to everybody i'm gonna go get some sleep now thank you guys for watching and i will see y'all next time